This video is sponsored by Squarespace. So uh, what is this video? Well, I have all this gear. I'm gonna show you how to put it all together to create a rig that is fully automated. And what do I mean by that? What I mean is that you can control everything from the computer, even if you are 2000 miles away from the actual rig. So that's what I mean by remote ready is that anything can be controlled from the computer. And if you have the right software, probably fully automated, meaning you could just, you know, tell your little uh, mini computer here installed with Nina, start the imaging run 20 minutes after uh, twilight and go all night on this object, take the flats automatically, uh, do all the rotation automatically, autofocus automatically, and it's going to take care of all of those imaging tasks without any intervention from you. That's the hope at least. <laughs> the, getting that all working how you want is actually a lot of work. And I've been practicing with this whole imaging setup actually for a while to make sure that it's all working to get all of the kinks out before I send it remote, which I'll talk about in a sequel to this uh, video as well. But th in this video, I just sort of wanna focus on the gear itself, how to put it all together, and I'll sort of go through each piece of gear and talk about its purpose in a rig like this. Now, this video will definitely be of interest for people who are thinking of sending a telescope uh, to a remote observatory, but I think it will also be of interest to the more techie among us who maybe just want to put together a fully automated rig for fun, maybe to put in their backyard observatory and just let it uh, run while they're sleeping. So let's jump into it and let's start with the mount. This is the mount I've decided to go with. This is the iOptron Gem 45, Gem meaning German equatorial mount. Um, it's still lightweight for a German equatorial mount, but it's not in their uh, SEM series, their CEM, center equatorial mount, which are super lightweight. This one's a little bit uh, beefier, but it has a very good reputation. Um, I'm thinking it's gonna work pretty well for this application. Now, the reason I went with an iOptron mount is uh, really comes down to one main thing, which is that it has a homing sensor. And so what that means is that if it, if the power gets cut for some reason, when this is uh, operating in the remote observatory, you can, through software, tell it go to zero position and it can go to this position here with the counterweight down and the telescope uh, pointed at the celestial pole, which is what you want uh, to start any night uh, imaging, right? So. That's why I went with this one. Uh, it's, you know, I've had very good luck with Skywatcher mounts like the EQ6R, but they don't have that homing sensor. Uh, so if they do get lost, uh, how do you, and, and then the roof closes, it's sort of difficult to know how to get back to pointing at the stars when you have no idea where the telescope is pointed. I went with the iOptron because I could, um, but there's plenty of mounts today. They don't have to be super expensive that have homing sensors. Uh, many of the new harmonic drive mounts like the ZWO AM5 and AM3 have it as well. Um, so you can, you can get something as cheap as an AM3, which I think is $1,500, and it still would have this sort of capability to be remote ready. So the reason I didn't go with the AM3 or AM5 is because to me, those their big advantage is their, their small size as travel mounts. So I, like, I would rather keep them for that purpose and have a more traditional uh, style mount in a remote observatory. This isn't really a review, but I just wanted to show on this iOptron mount, I do like how they laid out uh, all the ports. Uh, so your, in, your major inputs, your USB and your uh, power are here on the back along with the power switch and then your uh, pass-through options for your imaging rig up here are up here in the saddle. I'm not sure how much I'm going to really be using those because 
I, you're going to see here in a moment that I'm going to be using this uh, Pegasus Ultimate Power Box, which has plenty of ports itself. Okay, next up we have a power strip. And you may be thinking, why is Nico talking about a power strip? Well, this is more than your average power strip, uh, both in price and capability. This is an internet enabled uh, power strip. So it has eight um, power outlets, you know, AC power outlets that are remotely switched, meaning that uh, through the internet, I can turn these off and on. And then it has two always on uh, uh, outlets right here. And so you basically just need to uh, connect this either through Wi-Fi or uh, the ethernet port here to the internet. And then you can control the power on everything in your rig that is connected to this. Why have this? Well, um, there's a lot of troubleshooting I've done over the years where the most foolproof way of doing that troubleshooting is turn it off and on, right? Um, but you don't really have that option unless you're physically there, typically. So this lets you the, do the turn it off and on uh, remotely. As long as this is getting power and internet, you can then um, know, okay, my mount is connected to remote switch one, my camera is connected to remote switch two, and so forth, and, I, and maybe the power box is connected to remote switch three, and then I can turn each of these off and on independently, um, and that, that will pro hopefully uh, save my bacon sometime. Um, it is a little bit expensive. This one is from Digital Loggers. I think it's considered sort of like the Bentley of the of the style of uh, device and internet connected uh, power strip. There are cheaper options out there as well that probably work just as well. For whatever reason, I decided I just want to get the the one that is uh, most recommended. Okay, next up we have the telescope, and this is the Ascar. FRA 500, F5.6 APO, but I'm using it with the optional F3.9 0.7X reducer, bringing it down to 350 millimeter focal length at F3.9. So basically <laughs> turning a telescope into sort of a, a camera lens in terms of the focal length, but it, it's the kind of thing that I really love uh, doing, shooting a little bit, faster but still but f3.9 is sort of perfect because you can still use normal three nanometer uh, narrowband filters and so uh, this is basically what i'm going to be using at a remote dark site hopefully to go after really really dim objects um, both in narrowband and broadband but um, I'm, I'm mostly i'm especially excited about sort of hunting for really dim things uh, with like an oxygen three filter at F3.9 under Bortle One Skies. That's just sort of the the whole purpose of this uh, rig. Now, we're gonna do a number of things to uh, add on to this telescope. We're gonna start rigging it out. The only thing that I've done so far is we have this multi-connection plate from Ascar attached to the handle up here. This is where we're going to um, put in this William Optics Uniguide guide scope with an ASI 290mm mini uh, guide camera on top for guiding. And in terms of guide scopes, um, I love these William Optics Uniguides. I find that today guide scopes with rings are just not as stable and 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 reliable as something like this, where they've just bolted on or glued on the. Um, uh, the finder shoe, and it's like a nice long finder shoe right to the bottom of the scope like this. So these, this line of guide scopes is now my favorite, the William Optics Uniguide. And you can see it matches uh, this Ascar FRA scope really well with the uh, red, white, and black. Okay, uh, in terms of rigging, so we did, we added the multi-connection finder plate. The next thing that I want to do, two things. One is I have this. This is a little 3D printed part from Buckeye Stargazer. 
that's gonna let me attach this. This is a Melee Quieter 3Q mini PC to the side of the telescope like that. So basically this little 3D printed bracket will uh, screw onto the mini PC and then that will screw onto the rings. The other thing that I'm gonna wanna do with the rings while I have them off is replacing this short dovetail plate with a much longer Lasmandi dovetail plate. The reason I wanna do this is I found through testing with this whole rig that after I add all the things that I want here to the camera side, it's way too heavy on this side. And I don't have enough length with this dovetail plate to firmly secure it uh, to the mount. Basically, I'm only using one of the two um, locking mechanisms on the saddle and I wanna be using both. So that's why we're gonna replace the smaller plate with this much longer plate. Okay, like I mentioned, this is a part from Buckeye Stargazer. To make sure that I get the spacing right, I'm gonna leave this shorter plate on for now while I attach this. And basically this just attaches with these two included quarter inch 20 machine screws like this. And then once we get that on there, then we'll attach the computer to that. Okay, that's on there now. So now I'm gonna take off this uh, bottom plate. And this is getting replaced with this super long Lasmandi plate. I'm putting all of the extra plate up here so that I can balance it up here as needed uh, because again, this is gonna be back heavy. Okay, now we have our plate on and we have our mounting bracket for the Melee uh, mini computer on. So now we just have to attach the Melee mini computer to the mounting bracket. Okay, done. So I put the uh, ports on the bottom here so they'd be a little safer from condensation and dew. And so the top looks like that, just the power button, but this is going to be um, in sort of an always on configuration. You can set up this Melee mini computer to whenever it has power just to immediately boot. So it's gonna be basically always on. Hopefully we'll never have to worry about touching that button. So pretty simple, right? And there's some also some ports uh, here on the front. Okay, before I fully tighten down those two screws, I'm going to put on my power box here and make sure that I like the positioning of that with the rings. Now, this is the Pegasus Astro Powerbox Ultimate V2. I think they have come out with the V3 since I bought this one, but this one works fine for me. It's nice and lightweight. And again, I have a 3D printed uh, mounting bracket on it. This is again from Buckeye Stargazer. I think you can buy this on Agena Astro though, if you want to, or on his website. So, and I'm gonna put this right here in the finder shoe bracket. Okay, like that. And then the guide scope's gonna go in right here. And I wanna make sure with this configuration that I can still fit in the power lead. Let me show you that. And yep, it fits in just fine. So everything is good in terms of uh, the placement of the rings and all the different accessories here. And just in case uh, I have to take the rings back off and I forgot where I want them placed uh, in terms of where the telescope is, I'm just gonna put a piece of yellow electrical tape right there to save me time adjusting that uh, later. Okay, next up is the focuser. So the Ascar FRA 500 has a very nice uh, dual speed focuser. You have the coarse knob on this side and you have the coarse and fine knob on this side. You can see it has markings, a manual rotator, and we can't use any of these if we are remote or we want the telescope to be fully automated because you can't actually be there Remember, anything we're doing with this scope, we're, we're imagining you can't actually be there to adjust focus, you can't actually be there to adjust rotation angle. 
So I have two Pegasus products here. This is their new Falcon Rotator V2, and this is their new Focus Cube V3. And so we're gonna install these two things. And with these two, we will be able to focus remotely, autofocus remotely, and uh, change the rotation angle automatically as well. And so is, are these necessary? Some kind of autofocuser is definitely necessary if you're going remote or fully automated, uh, because if you're not out there, uh, you're, you're gonna need to focus somehow uh, with temperature changes and all these different things, filter changes, all kinds of things can shift focus. So you need the ability to focus from your uh, computer. This is not as necessary, right? If you are okay with just having one rotation angle, fixed rotation angle for your telescope and camera, then you don't need a rotator. I'm not okay with that. Uh, for me, uh, picking rotation, especially with a wide field instrument like this, is half the fun, and it really adds to my enjoyment of the hobby uh, to be able to pick compositions. It also helps with some of the mosaic work that I'm doing uh, near the pole, where changing, you know, if you don't have the ability to change the rotation angle, you do so much, you end up doing so much more work with the mosaic. I've been testing this. It works really well. I have one little uh, quibble with it, which is just that with the software that I like using Sequence Generator Pro, I do have to turn on reverse. But as soon as I turn on reverse, it works perfectly. For some reason with reverse off, uh, it's not working happily with Sequence Generator Pro. I've heard uh, from others that that's not an issue if you're using Nina, which is a very other popular uh, software solution today. One more thing to mention about the rotator is it, when you buy the rotator, it doesn't come with these adapters that you're going to need to actually attach it to your telescope and camera. They sell these separately so that you can just get the ones that you need. So in this case, I'm using the uh, M68M to M48F to attach to the telescope side, to attach to the reducer here. And I'm using the M68M to M54M to attach to the filter wheel side. This is, once you add in these uh, adapters, it uh, makes it perfect in terms of back focus for using a filter wheel and a normal astronomy camera. You don't have space for an OAG unless you go for a very, very slim filter wheel. I think Pegasus does make it, but I'm using a ZWO filter wheel, so I'm just going to be using a guide scope, which I think should work fine, especially at this focal length, only 350 millimeter. Okay, so that's the rotator. Um, this is the, let's go down to the focus cube now. So installing the focus cube, this works like many other autofocusers you may have seen. Um, basically you just remove this coarse focusing knob. It has little couplers. You attach it to there and then um, it's allow, it gonna allow you to, it has a little motor and controller inside. You just hook it up to your PC and it will uh, allow you to change this. This one, the Pegasus Focus Cube V3 is USB-C powered and that also handles communication to your PC. Comes with a sensor for sensing the ambient temperature. And so you can change focus based on, you know, every, uh, let's say, two degrees centigrade change in temperature. Let's run the autofocus routine again. Has an optional hand controller. Um, you can see that this is just a little metal dowel. Um, smooth, except for one side has a flat edge, which is important, because then what we're gonna do is we're gonna attach one of these included uh, couplers, and they have little set screws in them to this metal dowel. There's gonna be another metal dowel here once we take off this coarse focusing knob, and that's how you attach the focus cube 
to there. Now it's not gonna be strong enough just to attach with just a little coupler. So it also comes with other mounting hardware that we're gonna use to attach it to the bottom of the uh, focuser here. So you can see that comes off pretty easily. This coarse focusing knob is just held on by one little uh, set screw. This just goes in here, you loosen that up and then this comes right off. Okay, I've uh, constructed this little L bracket that comes with the focus cube. You can see there's three little uh, screws right there and then this can go up and down once you get it to the right height to match uh, the height here, then you just tighten those up. Okay, the focus cube comes with five different uh, sized couplers here. So we're just going to try these one by one until we find one that fits this shaft. Here it is. You can see that one fits. There's two little grub screws or set screws on this side. And I've loosened both of those to get that on here. But now what we want to do is connect or tighten those down and make sure that one of those grub screws is making contact with this flat surface right here on the uh, focuser shaft. Okay, once that's installed, you should see that the coupler is moving uh, with the focuser when you rack it in and out like that. You just wanna fully tighten that down, make sure that it's nice and secure on there. Okay, this is now the trickiest part of this. We need to attach the focus cube to a computer or to your phone or something. Um, it, when I say your phone, it, it has a Wi-Fi uh, connection built in, but you would still need to connect it to power. Uh, and the reason we have to do this is we're gonna have to turn this little uh, focus shaft here until the flat part matches up now with the grub screw here and that this is still like this. So it's a little bit of a complicated operation, but it's not too bad uh, once you uh, try it out. Okay, so I have the Unity platform open up here from Pegasus and I'm just watching the flat part and I'm hitting the move 100 steps until it matches up with that grub screw. Maybe one more, oh, a little bit too much. Okay, and I fine tuned it here and that looks good. So now I'm ready to push that piece in. Okay, I've attached or tightened up the two grub screws on either end here. So now the last piece is just attaching this piece uh, to the bottom here and then tightening up the screws just holding on the focuser to this L bracket. Okay, so now this is, this bottom piece of the L bracket is attached to the bottom of the focuser with an included washer and machine screw. And we can take this piece out now. This is the tensioning or locking knob for the focuser, but we're not gonna need that because once you put an auto focuser on, this is, locked, right? Unless you're actually using the autofocuser. Um, so you don't need this piece anymore. But you should set it aside somewhere safe uh, where you know where it is in case you ever want to take this off. Uh, like if you're selling the scope or something, you would want that piece back. So now I'm just doing some configuration with the software and the focus cube connected, making sure that it can of course move the focuser and uh, setting the zero point right here. And now I've just hit go to 10,000 and I'm just watching it and making sure and make sure that it's moving out uh, steadily and there's no binding or anything like that. And I, I can also watch the coupler down there and making sure that that's moving smoothly without any sort of um, stoppages or rough points and everything looks to be going quite well. I don't see any uh, issues. Here's all the leftover parts from the focus cube plus the knob and uh, lock screw that I took off of the focuser. I'm keeping these all in one labeled bag. I have a drawer in my garage for 
for this kind of stuff, but it's important you label it because otherwise you're just gonna have a drawer full of parts you have no idea <laughs> where they came from. This video is sponsored by Squarespace. I use Squarespace at nicocarver.com because it makes it easy to create and maintain a great looking website with their guided design system called Squarespace Blueprint. You can choose from many professional templates and then customize them to your taste quite easily as I'm showing here. There are lots of features built in. For example, if you wanna sell products or prints or services, you can set up an online store and Squarespace has flexible payments uh, for your customers, including PayPal, Apple Pay, credit cards, Afterpay, and ClearPay. So your customers can pay however works for them. So whatever kind of website you're looking to make, Squarespace has you covered. And right now you can get a free trial by heading to squarespace.com slash nebulaphotos. And when you're ready to make a purchase of hosting or a domain, you can get 10% off with code nebulaphotos. Okay, next up we have the Falcon V2 Rotator from Pegasus. Installation of this is much easier than the Focus Cube. You just need the adapters for your rig and then you just uh, screw it on with the this sort of um, bump out piece, this motor piece uh, facing to the front, facing towards your the front of your telescope, right? Um, that's important. So this blue part is going to be facing the camera. Okay, I've screwed those on. You can see uh, we have reducer, Falcon rotator, filter wheel, camera. And the camera is bolted to the filter wheel. The connection between the reducer, the rotator, and the filter wheel is all of those threaded adapters. Um, and this is uh, even accounting for uh, one, you know, a little bit of an additional back focus due to the filters inside the filter wheel. This is the perfect back focus for this system. Um, it's actually 56 millimeters because we're using, um, you know, filters that have their own thickness and those add a little bit of back focus to the calculation. Um, but we even have some more wiggle room if we needed to continue messing around with back focus because I do still have this uh, little uh, tilt plate uh, on the camera right here. So we could take this off and that would give us even a little bit more uh, adjustment uh, for back focus if we needed it. I've already tested this uh, rig as is and it didn't need any kind of tilt adjustment or anything like that, so we're good to go. Uh, but if we needed it, we, we could add in a little tilter somewhere here. It, it would have to be a fairly thin one, but I think they do make them. Okay, we're almost there with the components. So we now have the camera, the filter wheel, the rotator, the autofocus are all attached. Next up is the power box. You don't need this massive power box necessarily, but this actually is pretty lightweight. This is the Ultimate V2. Um, one of the reasons I like this one is because all of these USB ports are controllable from the software. It just gives me lots of options that I like. And also I like the how the uh, power in is this, this style. So there's no confusion over power in versus power out because on a lot of power boxes, they use the same connector. So I do like this one, but you can probably get away with a smaller one depending on your setup. But this one does fit very nicely right in here. And I can just put now the guide scope on the top and we have computer, we have power box, focuser, we have guide scope. What else do we need for a fully automated rig? Flats, right? Um, now, you could probably get away with uh, going fully automated without a flats panel. If your roof is automated right on your observatory, then you can just uh, wait until, uh, you know, right before sunrise uh, when you know you have a sort of a blue sky that it's not too bright and just point your telescope straight up and do sky flats. I'm choosing uh, not to do that because just I've always been in the habit of doing flats with a flat panel so I'm just gonna uh, keep with that um, but of course since you're not there to put the flat panel on you need one that has a motor attachment so that it can flip up. Uh, so it flips down 
when you're uh, done for the night. It flips up when you're imaging and it flips back down and lights up when you're doing flats. This is also nice because it's a dust cover, right, for your telescope. So uh, during the day, any pollen, any dust, any whatever isn't uh, hitting the glass. This is by a company called Wanderer Astro. They are also made by Deep Sky Dad, by Alnitak. All, there's one called the Alnitak Flip Flat that I think was the original one with this concept. And Prima Luce Lab also makes some good ones too. This one I got because it was the cheapest and uh, it it's now for sale in the US uh, Astro World Telescopes. The owner is Dan Higgins, very nice guy. He, he sells these in various sizes. So you just want to make sure that uh, the flat panel part completely is just a little bit bigger than the diameter of your dew shield here. So it completely covers uh, and fully illuminates your telescope. So this one is the 125 millimeter and it's a good fit for the FRA 500. But you can just basically do some measurements of your dew shield here and then just get the one that's slightly bigger. It comes with four zip ties. It's in the instructions. It only looks like they're using two to attach it to the dew shield. But I'm glad that it comes with four because uh, now I can test it, then uh, cut off the zip ties, and then I still have two left for when it gets to the remote destination. So you just uh, route the zip tie or zip ties through this little channel right down here right under the motor. You can see there's little felt pads that this sits right on your dew shield. And then it just comes around like this. You tighten it up, cut off the excess, and that's it, that's installed. So you can see now it has a cover for when not in use, and then will connect this whole motor up. It has it needs both power, 12 volt power and uh, USB connection uh, to here. And then this will connect to the computer and we'll be able to control the flat panel from software, open it up, do flats, all that kind of stuff. So all that is left here in terms of uh, getting this ready is cabling and the idea here with cabling is since both the computer and the power box are up here on the telescope, we should be able to contain almost all of the cables uh, up here on the top. In, in terms of cabling, uh, for the most part, you want cables to only be, of course, as long as needed um, to get from one port to the other. And that way with these shorter cables, uh, you have less of a cable mess up here, and so it will look nicer, but also uh, there's less chance of a cable catching on something as the telescope is swimming around. Now, there's an exception to going as short as possible, um, which is the rotator and the camera, right? Because the rotator, we need the cable to be long enough so that there's some slack here so that it can go back and forth, at least 180 degrees um, like this, back and forth without the cable being so short that when it tries to get over here, it either just pulls the cable out or, or it has to stop because it feels that tension. Um, and then the camera is has sort of the same problem because it's behind the rotator. So any cables that are coming out of the camera into the power box also have to have some slack for that reason. Um, now this can be a little bit tricky because with slack, we have to then start thinking about, okay, how is it going to catch on anything? So I'm going to try to be very careful with any, um, cable coming out from the guide camera here or any cables coming out from here that there's no chance that they're going to catch on something, uh, rotating back here. I'm always much more concerned with function over fashion when it comes to cabling. So 
as, as long as it's working and I've, I'm testing it, you know, on multiple nights to make sure everything is working, there's going to be no cable snags, then I'm going to be happy. Okay, what else do we have to think about if we are sending this remote? Well, one thing is um, if you're if you're actually literally sending it in the mail, um, this is a lot of expensive gear. So you definitely want to get uh, insurance uh, to cover the loss if, if, if it just gets completely lost in the mail. The other thing that you can do, um, it's just sort of another little extra thing for security, is you can uh, attach an AirTag. Uh, this is an Apple AirTag. And you can get discrete little plastic uh, covers for it. And so what I would do is I'd probably just put this AirTag in here, activate it, and just attach it somewhere directly on your rig that you're sending down so you know exactly where uh, the telescope is. Uh, and if anything goes wrong, you can sort of uh, find it again. Um, it's just the more you can hide this, of course, the better, because if someone finds the air tag and <laughs> rips it off and throws it in the ocean, then it's no good. So if you can sort of find a discreet place to to put this uh, in the package, that would be a, a good idea. Or I think maybe a discreet place to attach it directly to your telescope. The other thing I think about when shipping is um, if you still have the original uh, packaging, uh, that's a really good way to ship things because a lot of times, uh, you know, Astro manufacturers have thought through how to package things so that they'll arrive undamaged. So you can put the things back into their original packaging. Usually they're double boxed with two cardboard boxes and then, and then the unit inside. Before you take everything apart, to ship it, I would definitely take a picture. Um, and if someone at a remote telescope operation is setting it up for you, you can send them that picture and then they can know sort of how it's all supposed to look uh, once it's all put together. Okay, I've been cabling everything up and thinking about this some more. And I think what might make sense, I have these, um, I don't know if you can see this, these 3D printed parts for uh, cable management back here on the camera is to have the rotator cable going into the ZWO camera. I'm using the ASI 2600mm. The filter wheel is also routed through here and going into the camera. And then I just have this one cable with a fair amount of slack to allow for rotation coming from the camera into the power box. So I'm gonna try this tonight and see if I run into any issues uh, with full rotation back and forth. The Falcon rotator does have a uh, system so that it it won't just like keep rotating. <laughs> of course, it'll just it'll only go back and forth in in one on one side of the focuser, uh, which is what you want. Uh, this part of the telescope is still a little messy, but um, you know part of it is just that these dew heater bands are way too the cables are way too long. I, I, overall, I think this is working pretty well. All the cables are up here, you know, that nothing's dangling down. The only cables that I'll have um, running up here is uh, the power cable to the Pegasus uh, power box and the data cable from the back of the mount into the power box. Because this video is over 20 minutes long, you're now seeing the names of everyone who supports this channel through my Patreon campaign. The Nebula Photos Patreon is the primary source of income for this channel, and I now do this full time, so I can't thank you all enough for the support. If you're interested in joining, it starts at just $1 a month, and every tier gets access to my Patreon Discord channels, which include the monthly imaging challenge, and we also meet monthly over Zoom. There are higher tiers with some of the other perks like ad-free videos starting at $7 a month. And of course, you can also get direct messaging support with me. So whether you're just starting out and putting together your first kit or you have years of experience, I think there's a lot that I offer through Patreon that will make it worth it to you. When ready to join, head to patreon.com slash nebulaphotos and I hope to see you there. Till next time, this has been Nico Carver, Clear Skies.